Good morning and welcome back to the channel. So we've come somewhere completely different before. We've come to St. Aidan's, which is over near Leeds. Um, the area used to be uh, a coal mine and it has been um, repurposed into an RSPB reserve. Now, lots of people come to St. Aidan's throughout the year for lots of different reasons, but at the moment they have very much a star attraction and that star attraction is a glossy ibis. So there's quite a lot of people out on the path just ahead of us and I think they're probably in the area where the glossy ibis has been spotted. I've obviously not introduced you to Pops. Good morning. Hope you're all fit and well. And so obviously Pops has come along for the, for the journey as well. Have you seen a glossy ibis before Pops? Nope, never. And so from what I've seen, they look, I think in probably in poor light, quite a, a drab looking bird, but they really are quite an exciting looking bird. Um, and I'll bring you some more facts if indeed we do see one. So come along for the journey and see what we see. So it says they've got a little owl here as well. Oh, that'd be great if we could see one of them. Wouldn't it just? I love Beautiful. little owls. Yeah, love little characters. Fantastic little species, aren't they? They are that. What um, lens have you gone with today, Pops? I've just stuck me 180 to 600. Right. It's uh, rapidly becoming uh, quite a favourite of mine now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's so versatile. Yeah, I was just going to say, I would yeah. imagine in terms of its range from 180 all the way through to 600, it's probably the yeah. most versatile lens you've got, isn't it? Oh, it certainly is, without a doubt. And, and I've, you know, I'm quite pleased with the results that it's actually giving me. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, do you know, I think, I think a lot of uh, the viewers of our channel will be really interested in it because I think it is a lens that lots and lots of people are looking to um, for wildlife, isn't it? It is, it is. And it's certainly not disappointed in terms of sharpness, has it? Not at all, no. I, I, I'm quite blown away with it, to be honest yeah. with you. But having said that, I mean, I was at, at Yorkshire Photography Hides on Thursday and um, I did take my 800 along with me as well as my 180 to 600. Yeah. And uh, I, I did manage to uh, use my 800 on some of the uh, perches where the kestrels were coming down right. at the further away. And that was actually another question that we had yeah. from one of the viewers was, since getting your 180 to 600, are you still using your 800 mil lens? Oh, absolutely. Because I'll be absolutely honest with you, the quality of the print, uh, the uh, the images that I got with the 800, you could tell the difference. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, they they were sharper. And uh, I would say that's always going to be the, the payoff, isn't it, with a zoom? You yeah. get that versatility with yeah. a zoom. Yeah. Focal length from 180 mil, mil, which is quite a wide open for wildlife, all yeah. the way through to 600, which is your super te super tele range. Yep. Yeah. Um, and, and the, the payoff is sharpness, but personally, I don't think the sharpness is that much of a payoff. No, not at all, not at all. No, I, I'm, I'm really pleased with this lens. For the price, I think it's one of the best Z lenses for wildlife photography that you can, you can buy. Yeah. I honestly believe that, it's, it's a cracking lens. Well, there's quite a crowd gathering on the uh, the path ahead of us, which I'll turn the camera around in a minute so you can see it, which can only mean one thing, and that's that the glossy ibis is showing, so fingers, fingers crossed. crossed. <laughs> yeah. The ibis. Yeah, our How, first. <coughs> yeah, I would say probably 10 metres from the path. Yeah, about 10 metres. Yeah, the yeah. only problem is, yeah. I think this possibly, you know, I think that's actually a moorhen. We'll move around to the reed beds in a moment, but yeah. <coughs> I think that the only kind of, well, there's two things. The first one I'm going to say, which is something that I comment on all the time on this channel, <laughs> the, the light. light. <laughs> uh, we've, left, we've left Derbyshire where it was glorious sunshine and we've come to Yorkshire and it's thick cloud. <laughs> so the light was against yeah. us a little bit. Yeah. Um, I actually think though, had it been clear, it would have been worse because 
the sun would have been behind it and with it being a dark subject that would have made it quite difficult and quite challenging to photograph yeah um, so the overcast light's actually not too bad but what that meant was we were bringing shutter speeds down i was shooting at about 800 of a second uh, 500 500 of a second yeah yeah and then the other kind of really big challenge um and it is always a problem i think with any focusing system but with a mirrorless particularly shooting through reeds and grass um is problematic isn't it it, it is <coughs> it is and especially when you've got basically a black bird on the other side yeah um yeah, it certainly didn't have like a distinguishing eye or anything for the tracking no, to be no, able to all. lock onto. Yeah. No. Um, so it's quite quite challenging to be able to focus on it. I know um, I started off with a three D tracking, but very quickly I was switching to um, single point focusing. Yeah, no, I, I was using three D tracking, and when it came out of the the, uh, the sort of grassy areas, it wasn't so bad. I could yeah. lock onto it. Yeah, but um, it was a struggle. It was a struggle. But yeah. we've seen one, and that's what we came for, and, and we've got some photographs, and then right at the end, which is why we're talking quite loudly now, rather than whispering as we were a moment ago on the, on the path, um, yeah. it's flew off. And it's flew off probably only about 25, 30 metres away, um, but it's far enough away to be probably a bit too far for a photograph. Yeah, um, yeah. And we got some shots of it in flight, but because our shutter speeds were quite slow, because I was expecting it just to kind of be wandering, meandering along the edge, um, probably not quick enough for a flight shot. No, um, no, I, I've looked at mine and they're too soft. But if we've got anything yeah. decent, I'll pop it up on the screen now so you yeah. can see it. Yeah. Before we get into the nitty gritty details, let's start with a quick overview. The glossy ibis, scientifically known as Plegardis felinellus, is a medium-sized wading bird belonging to the ibis family. Found in a variety of wetlands, these birds have striking appearance that sets them apart. One of the most distinctive features of the glossy ibis is the glossy iridescent plumage. Their feathers shimmer in shades of deep purples, greens and bronze, especially during the breeding season. Unfortunately, this bird is in its winter plumage and not quite as iridescent as we would hope. Glossy ibises are highly adaptable and can be found in a wide range of wetland habitats. From freshwater marshes to saltwater estuaries, they are quite versatile. These birds are known to inhabit regions across Europe, Asia, Africa, the Americas and Australia. Now let's talk about the feeding habits. Glossy ibises are skilled foragers using their long slender bills to probe the mud for a variety of prey. Their diet includes small invertebrates, insects, crustaceans and even small fish. Watching them feed is a spectacular event. Glossy ibises are also known for their impressive migratory journeys. Some populations undertake long distance migrations, flying thousands of miles between their breeding and wintering grounds. This showcases their incredible navigation skills and endurance. Before I finish, I'd like to touch on conservation status of the glossy ibis. While they're not currently considered globally threatened, their populations in some regions face challenges due to habitat loss and degradation. It's essential to raise awareness and support conservation efforts to ensure their continued well-being. And there you have it, our journey into the world of the glossy ibis. These birds are not just visually stunning, but also play crucial roles in maintaining the balance of their ecosystems. So that was pretty good, weren't it, Pops? Absolutely. Yeah. <coughs> we probably had. It's rare, actually, that we come to a, a, a reserve with a species, a target species in mind, and walk down the path and it's there in front of us. <laughs> <laughs> Nine times out of ten, we have to work really hard to find it. Yeah. Uh, but today, it was very obliging when it was probably only 10 15 meters from the path yeah and we've got some i'd say we've got some decent shots of it i would think so i hope so so yeah. what we're going to do now is it, it's flown off and um a little bit further down so rather than chase it what we're going to do is we're going to head off have a look into the reed beds and see if we can see any of the bearded reedlands um and what mm. else is on offer we've seen some stone chat stone chat kestrel, kestrel. Yeah. so uh, in fact as we're focused on the ibis there was a kestrel just behind us that was being mobbed by a crow and it was making a right racket. It certainly was. Uh, definitely had my camera pointing in the wrong direction at that point because that would have made a fantastic photograph, wouldn't it? It certainly would have. Yeah. 
by the time I got my camera up, it had gone, it had disappeared. <laughs> and I, I think that's it's always the downside of having your camera on a tripod. Uh, when you've got it slingshot and you're picking it up and you're pointing, you're taking your shots. Um, the versatility is great, isn't it? You know, you can without a doubt, yeah. Point it in the right direction and get the shot quite quickly. But when you're on a tripod, your, mo your mobility is a little bit more reserved. So by the time yeah. I'd swung the, the tripod around, the Kestrel was at home. <laughs> it was miles away. Is that another little storm shot on the on there? So we'll just walk through the, oh, there's some egrets. Egrets, yeah. Yeah, egrets flying across. So we're in the reed bed area now, um, mm. and it's just going to be a case of scanning the reed beds. We're looking for the bearded reedling mm -hmm. um, and whatever else can be seen in the reed beds. Yeah, I believe there's a bittern. Yeah, well, they did say that there yeah. is bittern in yeah. the area, isn't there? Another kestrel dab. So it looks like... The light gods have blessed us. <laughs> now some geese coming over, Dad. Oh, too late. Yeah, grey legs. Yeah. Uh, and there's been a little bit of a break in the clouds. And the sun's poking through. But of course, when that happens, we've got nothing to photograph. <laughs> 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 it certainly didn't do it when the glossy ibis was there. <laughs> but maybe, just maybe, this light will be there and we'll get a lovely little flock of bearded reedlings. <laughs> and it'll be just perfect. <laughs> and then again, it might not. No. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm very impressed with the. Uh, St. Aidan's Arrows PB Reserve, it's beautiful, isn't it? It is, it is. And it's yeah. really quite a diverse yeah. um, reserve. You've got some really big expanses of water. Uh, you've got some tight, narrow, almost like canal systems. You've got really, really big, heavy reed beds. And then you've got some kind of marshlands, haven't you? That are, yeah. Um, yeah. And so as a result of that, because it's such a diverse amount of vegetation and ecosystems the, the the diversity in terms of the species of birds that you're seeing is is quite vast isn't it it's it certainly is it's absolutely uh, amazing well the lights come back again it has we've got some beautiful light it's a shame that at this point in time there is not a great lot to we've seen loads of birds though haven't we we have we have just yeah. not been in that many positions where we can photograph them no um no, but I'm impressed with this place. Yeah, it's really definitely a place impressed. that's probably yeah. worth coming back in the, the spring when things have, are all got chips. Yeah, and yeah. So we've done a loop. Not seen any of the bearded tits, unfortunately. Um, and we're back where we are at the start, and it would appear that the glossy ibis has made another appearance. So we'll get ourselves set up, and hopefully some nice shots of it and um, hopefully it'll catch a frog or something like that and you know be trying to swallow the, the frogs it's the frog for the flog the, the frog's got its legs wrapped around his bill and, and it's a, an epic battle yeah or maybe it'll just do like it's done so far and that's hide behind the reeds and make it almost impossible for us to get a photograph yeah. But yeah. whatever it does, so inconsiderate, really, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Needs a good talking to. It bloody does. It's there at the back. It's there. I can see it. Yeah. Cheers. 
so it's just in front of us again. But just like last time, it's predominantly behind. There's a bank of reeds, um, which is just a raised bank on the other side of the block of water. So it's like a, a, a drainage channel in front of us. Um, and then on the other side of that, it's raised. And then that's got reeds running all the way across along the top of it. And invariably, it's sat just behind them. Um, you can probably see that on the video that it's completely obscured by the, the reeds and the grasses that are sticking up in front of it, which is causing absolute carnage with the autofocus system. So you're either having to manually focus, which is, is fairly straightforward. Um, a lot of the Nikon lenses now, you can just manual override your autofocus. So the minute you start moving the um, focusing ring on the lens, it allows you to manually focus. Or what I'm favoring to do at the moment is to use single point focus. Um, so rather than using the 3D tracking or the wide area small that I would ordinarily use, I'm falling back on the single point focus and making sure that the single point is on the ibis and not on the, obscured by the grass. And that's allowing me to get my focus right the way through the obstructions. Unfortunately, it might bring you a photograph, but what it's not doing is bringing you a nice clean photograph of the, of the subject. Um, but he's happily feeding at the minute, so we'll just stay with him and see what he does and see if he moves into any area where it's quite clear and we can get a decent photograph. just been tracking it in the field um, for probably the best part of I'd say 20 minutes mm -hmm. and then it's up to flight and flew diagonally but towards us um, and has just landed down behind some reeds at the moment so we can't see it but I definitely got a couple of shots of it in flight did you Pops? Yeah but I'm not I'm not entirely happy with them right. well, I've just looked on the back of my camera. What shutter speed were you at? 1600. Yeah I was at 1600. Yeah. No, I I think the only thing that would kind of potentially would be a downside for me would be that I had a two times teleconverter on my lens because um, when it was perched it was quite far off so I'd put the teleconverter on. Oh, is that a swan coming towards us? Or is it going away from us? I think it's going away from going us away. actually. And whilst the two times teleconverter plus the lens gives you some, some nice images, I always think the minute you put a teleconverter on a lens that there is a little bit of uh, degradation to it to the quality Just a of the bit, yeah so which is in this shame. light it will be yeah yeah because yeah. it's not ideal is it no so we'll just hang on for a little bit longer just to see if it makes another appearance but it's certainly not been a wasted visit has it no not by any means no never never seen one of these these uh glossy ibis before and it's just an amazing experience to see it yeah I think the only thing that's left really is to see if Pops can come up with a song about it, to be honest with you. Because <laughs> he always seems to, you know, pull a little song out of the hat well, for everything else. It's, it's, it's not a British bird song, you know. Oh, well, you can do it with a Spanish accent if you want, Pops. <laughs> I'll have to have a little think about that. Well, you heard it here. What's the Ibis song coming to you soon? <laughs> So we came here with the intention of photographing the glossy ibis and we certainly achieved that, didn't we Pops? Oh, we certainly have. I mean, we'd only been here five minutes and it was there. <laughs> <laughs> then we went around all the, the uh, pools of water around here and looking for a, a bearded tits. Some bearded tits, yeah. Didn't see any. No. Nope. And then when we came back, the ibis was still there. <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah, I mean, we've had we've had a fantastic encounter with the glossy ibis, and we've seen a whole plethora of other birds. Um, 
But the glossy iris was what we came for, and so we can't be dis disappointed in the fact that we've seen it. Never disappointed. So yeah. Never. The, the, the things I would say is it, it is absolutely freezing cold. I mean, it's barely above freezing. It's probably about one or two degrees. My fingers feel like they're going to drop off. Um, my pops has got a nice pair of seal skin gloves on that I bought him for Christmas, so his hands are nice and toasty. Uh, but with my fingerless gloves on, my fingertips are frozen. Um, and I think that last stint when we were stood watching the glossy ibis for probably about half an hour was probably about 10 minutes too long, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, just about, yeah. Yeah, it got really cold. Yeah. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. If you have, consider giving it a like. If you've not yet subscribed, please consider doing so. We've got 4,000 subscribers now and we'd really appreciate every single one of them. We've got a Buy Me A Coffee webpage. I'll pop a description, uh, a link to it on the bottom and there'll be a, a link in the uh, description for the video as well. And until next time, ta-ra! Ta